Okay, so I am now going to switch over to our speaker, uh, who I am uh, thrilled is actually here, Mishi, Mishi Tobler. Um, from, uh, Mishi is, uh, as you can see, he is a professor of biology at Kansas State University, Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, he has this wonderful website, www.sofilife.info. Uh, uh, I learned a lot of stuff reading that website, so really, uh, uh, it's a fun place to go to if, if you have a real scientific bent. But um, so Mish, I, I want to just say a few words about Mishi before I let him start. Um, you know, he's a professor. It's hard to, to, get, to get him to stop. So so just yesterday, yesterday morning, you know, I was going to think about what I was going to say about to Mishi. So I, I sent him a note. I said, hey, Mishi, you know, shoot me your, 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 your CV. And uh, five minutes later, I get his CV and I opened, the, uh, I opened it. Mishi's CV is... 29 pages okay now if you work if you ever work in, in academia the most important part of the cv the curriculum vita is the number of publications right it's a it's a uh, publish or perish uh, type of a, a business mishi has 123 peer-reviewed publications Okay, and so what does that mean for those of you, you know, having come uh, out of academia? Um, so to get a peer review publication, you submit a manuscript to a scientific journal, okay, and the editor of the journal I will ask other researchers in the area to review your manuscript. I mean, this is done anonymously. Uh, the reviewers, usually there's two or three, uh, have, they have to agree with the way you collected data they have to agree with the way you analyze data. They have to agree with your conclusions. And then they have to agree that this is original research. So 123 publications means that there were that Mishi contributed 123 new learnings into sort of our knowledge base, which is just so he may well be the most accomplished scientist um, that we've ever invited to speak at MAS Mishi, despite the prone position you see in the picture, okay? Uh, and when you look, and about the picture, it's funny because we, we ask all the speakers to send us a picture, and there's usually what I call the 20% discount rule, right? Which is, uh, you know, if, if, the, if, if the speaker is like 30 years old, then, you know, the picture is usually about six years younger. If, uh, if the speaker is about 50 years old, the picture is usually when, you know, when, when he or she is about 40. I think there was a speaker recently that was about, that had a 40% discount, I think. Uh, but Mishi actually looks like this because I saw him, I saw him t uh, in, in uh, uh, Zoom on Tuesday. So if he looks like this, the way I see it, Mishi actually has averaged 10 or 12 publications a year since he graduated, okay? Which means that he has been publishing one article per month which makes me wonder how does he actually have time to give this talk, okay? So uh, so how does he how does he get to here where he is? Michi is Swiss. Uh, he graduated from the University of Zurich, uh, which I think is a feat. You know, if you've ever been to Zurich, it, it is probably the most single most expensive city I've ever been to. So that's a pretty tough to place to be a graduate student. I would think he went to University of Oklahoma, Texas A&M. He was at o Oklahoma State before ending up at Kansas. And one reason that I wanted to invite people like Mishi, Gary was saying, oh, you're interested in the speaker, um, was, uh, you know, I, I think that as an aquarium club, we want to try to bring people that are interested in the hobby into the, into the science of it. So particularly the young people, particularly, you know, the children. And I looked at Mishi's uh, CV he listed 46 high school and undergraduate students that have done work in his lab. So I'm impressed, okay? He's graduated five master's students, six PhDs, one postdoctoral scholar, okay? Um, he currently has uh, one master's student and, and two PhDs. And then here's another thing that's great. He, 
uh, there's a place on the, in, in the CV where he lists his, part, his participation on editorial boards uh, for these technical journals. So he's on the editorial board of Frontiers and Ecology and Evolution, Royal so Society of Open Science. And I love the fact that in the same paragraph, he lists that he is on the editorial board of Amazonas Magazine. So, I, you know, you got to love this juxtaposition of science and, 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 and the hobby. Uh, and he's also on the board of directors of the American Library Association, which is probably as equally as fulfilling as being on the MAS board. So other than some poor choices, maybe in football teams, um, there's actually very little critique in his resume. So if you, if you feel a little inadequate, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you start the morning tomorrow with, uh, uh, with some push-ups. So I've had enough fun with Mishi. Uh, so just a couple of things. He has so much stuff to present that when we basically scan through his presentation, we said, Mishi, go, maybe go a little longer. We usually try to hold our speakers to about 30 minutes. So we said, you know, go 45 because he has so much stuff to speak. Okay. And so he's, he's going to go for 45 and then uh, we'll do the poll, and then we'll have the breakout session. And uh, we actually suggested, and I don't know whether he's going to do it, but maybe we'll even uh, maybe he'll even show some slides, you know, in his breakout session because there's a there's so much stuff, and then there's so much of his detail. So I'm going to stop here, um, Kurt, and um, I'm going to let uh, you can let uh, Mishi then take over. So, share my screen quickly. Can you guys see that? Yes. All right. So, thank you very much, Willie, for the nice introduction, and thank you very much for having me here tonight. Uh, I have a few clarifications, though. Um, first of all, I do not look like on that photo. I gained about 20 pounds since this <laughs> pandemic started because I not only like fish, I also like a barbecue. Um, well, well, this is a pre- it's a pre-COVID picture, right, Michi? <laughs> That's right. It's a pre-COVID <laughs> picture. Um, and secondly, you know, the, the reason why I have so many papers is, is very simple. Um, I ha I've had the fortune to work with really talented students over the past 10 years. And really, uh, you know, most of my accomplishments ultimately are really the accomplishments of my students. And so they deserve really all the praise that Willie gave me because they're the ones that are working hard day in and day out. So um, that, that's the trick. You just have to find good students and you will pu um, publish many papers. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk a, a little bit about Life Bears to you today. Um, and um, as Willie said, I, I basically just have a, a rather long slide deck and my intention is not to go through it all. But rather, um, you know, I'll stop about between, yeah, as really said, between 35 and 45 minutes. And I'm happy to jump around. Um, I'm happy to talk about things that I'm not prepared to talk about. Um, feel free to interrupt me, uh, to ask any question you want. I enjoy when things are interactive and when I'm not the only one talking. But, you know, most of you probably have a pretty good idea what the life bearer is, right? Um, and... Um, it turns out when I ask people that question, they, they usually say, yeah, of course, right? That's the guppies, the mollies, the platies, the swordtails. Um, and I would, I would be willing to bet my money that at least 95%, um, maybe everyone on this call has at some point kept a life bearer. Um, and when I talk about, about life bearer, I have to clarify that there's many life bearing fish, right? Um, life bearing has evolved many, many times within, within, the, within the fishes. Um, sh there's life bearing sharks and rays. Um, there's there's a, um, a number of other species that do this. But when I talk about life bearers, I'm really talking about the piscillid fishes, the family piscillidae. Um, they're called the life bearers uh, as, as, as kind of the common name. and they're, they're characterized by, on the one hand, yes, being life-bearing, but in order to be life-bearing, um, 
you have to solve several problems, one of which is that you have to in, uh, fertilize your, your eggs internally, right? In order to solve the problem, pistillates are known for having so-called gonopodium, that's this modified anal fin that you can see right here on this molly male. Um, and that's really one of the uh, key traits to distinguish life bearers from, from other fishes and from other life-bearing fishes as well. And so live bears are restricted in their distribution largely to um, the Americas. So they um, inhabit uh, anywhere from uh, places, anywhere from North Carolina here in the United States, uh, all the way south uh, to Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, and, and in, in terms of some species, uh, even Argentina. So they have, a, they have a really, really, really broad distribution. But um, in terms of the diversity of life bearers, it's really concentra concentrated kind of in Mexico and Central America. And, you know, this kind of addresses perhaps uh, one of the biggest um, um, misconceptions about life bearers, and that there's that they're boring, right? They're considered beginner's fish. Um, everyone at some point has a guppy or a platy or a molly, uh, but then you move on to other things. Um, but the, the truth is that, um, number one, they're not boring. And number two, they're much, much more diverse and than people usually assume. So there's not only uh, a couple of dozen species, but there's, in fact, uh, over 280 species currently described between North Carolina and the United States and Argentina. And I was just want to brief, give you a brief overview of the diversity of life bears. Um, and I'm not going to go in great detail here. I'm going to do this in pretty broad strokes. Um, but what you see here on the left uh, hand side is a, an evolutionary tree that shows the relationship of all life bearing species. Um, and it includes about half of the species in this family, about 128 species, I think, uh, are in this tree. Um, the, and this tree was constructed essentially by DNA sequencing. But a long story short, it just gives you kind of an idea um, of what groups have many species in them and um, what groups uh, are, are not so diverse and how they're related, related amongst each other. And so you can see here marked by this kind of uh, this white line, you see um, these lineages that don't have very many species in them and they're really divergent from the rest of the family. And this is what I call the, the basal genera. So these are kind of the, the ancient life bearers. Um, they in, uh, include several genera, including Xenodexia, which is a, actually a life bearing species. Also Tomiris, this is a species from uh, South American, is actually the only species of life bearers uh, that is not actually life bearing. These actually lay egg, e eggs, even though they have internal fertilization. And then also Phyllocerus from South America belongs to this basal group. Phyllocerus cardimaculated is, is one of the species that at least in, in uh, occasionally can be found um, in the hobby. If you're uh, among the older generation and you kept fish in the 50s and the 60s, you might uh, remember Phyllocerus cardimaculatus because it was one of the most common fish in the hobby at one point. Now, next on in this kind of tree of life bearer life um, is a very large group that include the guppies, the mollies, and, and related species. This is one of the most diverse group of wild, uh, life bearers. It's really widely distributed all the way from the United States, uh, from the Univi United States down to Southern South America. So uh, definitely one of the uh, most intriguing groups, also one of the taxonomically most important groups um, and complicated br uh, groups within the family. It includes some amazing species um, like sailfin mollies, um, Mexican mollies that you can see right here. These are, this is a limia from the Dominican Republic. It also includes the guppies and micropacilia, and then the nesterodon. This is the South American group. Um, I've worked a lot with, these, with this group. This is one of my favorite groups of life bearers. Um, and Allison here is on the, on the talk, also studies a member of this group, the Amazon molly, which I actually just removed that slide yesterday because it's one of the most fascinating species because the Amazon molly is actually all female. It does not have any males in the species, but rather the females clone themselves um, and on the side steal a few sperms from other species that li live in the same habitat. So really, really cool biology. 
So if you move along the tree, um, you see a, a clay here kind of in the, in, the, in the first third of the tree. This is what I call the Cuban radiation. It turns out Cuba has a really fascinating uh, uh, radiation of life bearers on the island, including two genera, Quintana and Giardinus, which are both only find on Cuba. And what you see here is Giardinus metallicus, um, the black belly life bearer. Um, and this is a, one of the species from Cuba that's actually found fairly commonly in the aquarium hobby, even though there's, there has been no trade between Cuba and the United States, of course, in, in many, many decades. Then the next clay right here is what I call the Mesoamerican radiation. I already mentioned, right, um, lower Central America and Mexico is kind of a hot spot of Pacific diversity and a really large number of species actually occurred it, uh, there. Um, many of those species actually would be really attractive for the aquarium hobby, but um, they're, they're still kind of a, a niche phenomenon and not very many people actually keep them. Um, included in this group are the species like Alfaro coltratus, the knife life bear that inhabits like fast uh, swim, uh, flowing streams in Costa Rica and Nicaragua, things like Periapictes, which also occurs in small uh, streams in the same region. There's a whole number of species in the genus Brachyraphis. These are known as the brachys in the hobby. Beautiful fish that are really aggressive and tend to beat each other up. Um, and then Philictis here. This is uh, uh, a Philictis species, fair weather eye from Mexico. Uh, also a very dainty, very delicate fish. Many of these species are nowhere near as easy to keep as the guppies and the mollies that are very common in the hobby. Then if you move a, a little further along in the tree, you actually have a whole radiation of species that have diversified along the uh, Pacific coast of Central, Central America and Northern South America. So all the species that I've mentioned so far, they primi primarily occur in, in, uh, in eastward uh, dr uh, flowing drainages. And it's primarily the genus uh, Pisciliopsis. Here is a larger fish here in the genus Neoheterandria um, that uh, occur in those Pacific flowing drainages. Pisciliopsis here is also one of the really diverse um, groups. It has over 30 species described. Again, many species are actually perfectly suited um, for the aquarium hobby. And then last but not least, there is another giant clade here at the very tip of our phylogeny. This is what I call the North American radiation. It includes a number of genera, um, uh, including the sortails and the platy of the genus Saphophorus. These are fish that are very common in the hobby. Uh, and species um, of the genus Gambusia. These are the mosquito fish um, that occur in parts of the United States and have been introduced in many, many countries around, uh, around the planet. Um, besides that, there's, there's all these other small genera like Scolictes, um, like Carlhapsia, the fish that you can see here in the center, and also the genus Priapella that all make formidable uh, aquarium fish, but are really, really, really hard to find in the hobby. Um, except if you want a secret tip, uh, right now, wetspot.com uh, currently has Carlhapsia uh, kitteri uh, on sale. I ordered 20 yesterday to kind of amp, uh, amp up my colony, but this is a fish you don't see very often in the hobby. And then last but not least, there's also these larger species like uh, Pseudosaphophorus. Um, these are not so pretty, pretty. they're super aggressive, um, and that poses uh, some of uh, uh, some kind of different challenges in, in keeping them. Um, but the, the, that might be one reason why this particular species is not very common in the hobby. Now, I guess this is one of my pick take home message, uh, messages here for you right off the bat is, is don't think of live bears just as platys, sortails, and guppies. There's, there's an incredible amount of species out there um, that are really attractive for the hobby, that are a good challenge if you're into one uh, to keep them successfully and breed them. And there's really a whole, a whole world of life bearers to, to discover um, if you can find these fish um, in, in, in your neck of the woods. Now, what makes life bearers so special? But well, one thing is really the male reproductive biology and the female reproductive biology. Um, and 
what you can see here is kind of skeletal uh, sketches of different life bearing uh, species. And that kind of highlights some peculiarities of the males. I've already mentioned, right, they're characterized by these modified anal fin, the gonopodium. But you can see they also have modifications of other parts of their skeleton. So they have all these weird bony appendages that come off their vertebrae columns and turns out this is all connect connected with muscles and so they can actually move that gonopodium around in all direction um, and they do that in order to essentially transfer sperm packages um, that are um, basically released here at the base of the body and then um, somehow get to the tip of the gonopodium and through copulation um, they, they these sperm packages are essentially deposited on the female where they fertilize the eggs. Now, what's really peculiar is like, if you look at different uh, pistillates, they have really, really, really different gonopodia. So you have some species that have pretty short gonopodia, uh, and they actually have fairly complicated structures at the tip. And then you have other species that have really, really long gonopodia, sometimes longer than a third of the body. And what's really uh, interesting about that is that species don't only marry in the length of their copulatory organ, um, but this is correlated with a whole suit of, of traits, including their mating strategies. So species with long gonopodia uh, tend to uh, force copulate with females with, without female cooperation, um, whereas uh, males uh, or species with shorter gonopodia, they tend to have these elaborate uh, ornaments like beautiful colors, large fins, these sword appendages, and they court females um, seeking essentially female cooperation during the reproductive uh, process. And it turns out long and short gonopodia have re evolved repeatedly within, within the family of Pisilidae. So this, is, uh, uh, this, this type of sexual selection um, is, a, is one of the major drivers in the diversification of species across the Americas. Now, the females are all not all uniform. They actually have quite a bit of variation in their reproductive biology, too. Um, and it's two main things that distinguish different species in terms of their reproductive strategies. Um, one is the way females actually provide nutrients for their offspring. So some uh, um, species, they're called lecithotrophic species. This essentially means the female simply make an, a, a batch of eggs inside their body. They pack that egg full of yolk, as you can see right here in this first picture. Um, and then upon fertilization, an embryo starts to develop. But the only resources that embryo has available is the yolk that the mother put in the, into the egg. So essentially, these females just hold in the eggs um, during the time of the de development, and they wait until egg laying, until the, the offspring are essentially fully developed. And as a consequence, the offspring actually lose weight during development because the metabolism, the development, that takes energy, right? So some of that en energy is simply lost. Now, other life bearers, for example, the least killifish that are present uh, in the hobby uh, or Micropacilia pare, that's also very common in the hobby. Other species are matrotrophic, which means they make these tiny little eggs, right? And then as the embryo develops, they not only get nourishment from the yolk deposited in the eggs, but these females actually have placenta-like structures, just like mammals do. And they keep supplying their developing offspring with, with, with nutrients. So as the offspring develop, they grow larger and larger and larger. In some instances, the offsprings are, are over 100 times heavier than the initial egg. So they're just different reproductive strategies. The way you probably notice this most when you keep these fish in aquaria is that matrotrophy coincides often with the phenomenon called superfetation. And superfetation is essentially when multiple um, offspring stages are present in, in one mother. So if you have less heterotrophic species, they give birth in batches. Every 30, 35 days or so, females will give birth to a batch of, of offspring, right? If you have a matrotrophic species in your fish tank, you will get babies every three or four days. Just one or two uh, here and one or two there and four here and four there. That's because eggs are continuously produced, they're continuously fertilized, um, and you basically have multiple stage uh, embryo, uh, embryos in, in one female. Actually, what you see here dissected out in this particular female, these are all embryos at diff of different stages that came from this one individual. 
So I get really excited about the reproductive uh, biology of these species. Um, but I, I'm happy to talk about this more later on. But uh, what I really want to show you um, in the next um, um, 20 or 25 minutes or so is really kind of the diversity of habitats that we find these life bearers in and kind of the species diversity that you don't regularly see in, 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 a, in aquarium stores. So life bearers have the reputation of being, being highly say, uh, tolerant to high salt concentrations, which is true for some species, but um, actually um, some are actually really sensitive to high salt concentrations too. But what you see here is essentially a coastal lagoon on the Dominican Republic. And if you go fishing there, you indeed find some life bearers. You find things like Limia perugia um, that in that particular habitat actually coexist with a pupfish, so I printed it on the cozy. The truth though is that most life bearers do not occur in coastal wa uh, waters. The vast number, amount of diversity occurs inland, primarily in streams like this one, smaller high elevation streams, and also lower uh, lowland river, uh, larger lowland rivers, excuse me. Both of these pictures were taken uh, at field sites of ours. These are located in Southern Mexico. And I thought what I'd do for this trip is I just wanna show you uh, a few impressions from the field sites in Mexico. So this is an area <coughs> about you know the size of a county here in the United States, like all these field sites, all the pictures you can see today were taken about within about 20, 30, maybe 40 minutes of driving. So it's not, it's not huge in a huge area. And I decided to do that rather than show you a picture from all over the place. So you can really get an appreciation about really how many species there are. Because what we observe here in Mexico, you can really extrapolate uh, to different regions in, in, Central, in Central America. Um, as well. Now, how do life bearer habitats look like? Here's my only video. I try to keep the videos low in case there's folks around with a poor internet quality, but you can see um, this is one of my favorite species. Uh, this is Priapella, um, uh, Priapella compressa. I'm sorry, this was a uh, movie was taken in a stream at the uh, Mayan ru ruins in Palenque in southern Mexico. So if I would take the camera up here above the water, you would see giant um, temples um, that were built uh, hundreds of years ago um, by the Maya people. And this kind of illustrates a really typical life-bearing habitat in Central America in that there's um, lots of rocky substrate um, and lots of leaf liver, litter and twigs where the fish can hide in, but there's not a lot of aquatic plants. And I think this is a really a commonality of many, many habitats in, in Latin America that harbor these types of fish. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, in these kind of small streams that the Priapella inhabit, um, you of course also find other fish. So uh, Priya compressa is the one species I just showed you from underwater. Um, in a one river drainage over, over, it's a different species, Priapella chamula. Um, but these fish also occur with a wide variety of cichlids. I figured there's some cichlid um, people on the call. Um, we find species like this Paranitroplus, which, uh, is, is really rare in the hobby, um, and as well as this chuco intermedia, which is much more common. Um, so in all the places you go, most life bearers live um, side by side with other fish species. And if you are so inclined to do, you can actually also keep these life bearers along with these uh, larger fish species, as long as you don't expect to, to raise offspring out of that. Another species that I really love um, that lives primarily in these small, clear waters with rocky bottoms is Heterophallus milleri. It looks essentially like a small gambusia that somebody painted on. And these fish really live in the kind of the upper inch of the water at the very surface where the males constantly court the females. And they're just an exquisite sight to observe through the water surface. And then there's just some of the usual suspects that you can find in almost any habitat types. Chief among them are the mollies. Uh, you could probably go, uh, can't go anywhere in Latin America or Mexico where you don't at least find one molly species. And some species like Pacilia mexicana, um, they take very different uh, shapes, sizes, and colors depending on where you catch them. Um, other species like this Pacilia kikensis, um, they have more narrow distribution and they look much more uniform. 
Somalis can be found anywhere from those small mountain streams down to the larger rivers. And, and it's always the same species or almost always the same species, uh, even though they look very different at times from one another. And then in the rear, uh, area we study in, in uh, southern Mexico, two other species are fairly common. Uh, one, Pseudosophophorus biomaculatus, uh, occurs kind of more in the smaller streams, uh, higher up, whereas swordtails, um, Sophophorus heleri here, are more lowland fish, in kind of stagnant, muddy pools. That's why you can find a, a, a lot of these green swordtails, which is essentially exactly the same species as the green swordtail that is really, really common in the hobby. So maybe one reason these guys are so successful in the hobby because uh, we always joke in the field, they live in absolutely the worst conditions. Uh, you can uh, catch uh, swordtails in the same same hall as used diapers and other hygiene products. Uh, they don't appear to care and maybe that's why they're surviving in so many fish tanks um, in the hobby as well. Um, another group that's really diverse in southern Mexico um, are the mosquito fishes, so the gambusia. Um, these are much more drab colored species. Um, they can be incredibly hard to keep, even though they're ecologically really su successful and appear to survive in some of the most stressful environments. They're not actually easy aquarium fish. Um, Part of that is because, because especially the males, they're very susceptible to stress and it's really hard to transport them. And if you manage to get the males alive, uh, the other challenge is that, that the females are actually really, really aggressive um, towards the males and also towards their own offspring so that breeding these things are, uh, is not nearly as easy as, as some of the other species. And then king of the life bearers in Southern Mexico is, this, is the pike life bearer, Bilana sox, Bilicianus. These things can get up to a foot long. Um, and this is the only true piscivorous uh, species among the life bearers. So these are specialized fish eaters. You can tell this by these beak-like jaws with the sharp teeth. Um, and they really um, uh, primarily feed on actually other life bearing species and other small bodied fish um, they live with in the same habitat. And then last but not least um, are actually some of the en enigmas for me. Um, it took me seven years in Southern Mexico to catch my first platyfish. Um, this is Saphophorus maculatus, one of the species that is the ancestor of the platyfish in the aquarium. And you can see they're much, uh, generally much less attractive than the, what you can buy at a fish store. Um, they live literally in roadside ditches, in places where for many years I just simply did not think to stop for fish. Um, places where water gets 35, 38, 40 degrees Celsius, um, that to me seemed too hot to ca uh, have any fish, but they indeed do occur there. And that species that I only kind of found over the past couple of years are Calhopsia kitteri and Fer uh, Felictus fairweatheri, and both tiny, dainty little fish with really interesting behavior. Um, and some of them are a real challenge to keep. Um, although when you keep them successfully, they have uh, really interesting behaviors, uh, really interesting color patterns that change depending on the, uh, on the mood. Um, and, and they're really fun to have around. Now, other than um, pisillids, um, we catch a lot of tetras. Um, the main species of tetra we catch in southern Mexico are these Astyanax Aeneas. Um, they're just as common as the mollies, as the mollies in some areas even more. Um, these other two species are much rarer in comparison. Rikon guatemalensis um, is a species that gets really, really large. So this is a species that primarily occurs in larger river. And Hyphosobrycon compressa, in comparison, is a much smaller species, only about an inch, an inch and a half long, species that primarily lives in kind of uh, swampy backwaters. Um, and just as some of the gambusia, this species is really hard to handle and dies really easily in, in our nets and in the buckets. So I'm not aware that this species has ever been uh, kept um, in, in the hobby at all. And the same is true actually for this silver side species. So, so here in the bottom right, you see a silver side, a Thernella alvarezi. These are absolutely gorgeous fish, um, but just as the Hyphosobrycon, they're 
really sensitive. Um, they don't really do well with handling and transport. And I'm not also with this species not aware that anyone has ever kept this successfully in an aquarium. And then again for the cichlid species, um, the area also teams of cichlids, things that are common in the hobby like firemouth cichlids and uh, their close relatives uh, here. This is Thorictis mikai and Thorictis passionis. Um, the cichlid down here is Oscura um, heterospilla, I believe. And I'll be honest with you, I do not know what this is. I believe it's a hybrid uh, between one of the Thorictes um, as well as Astatheros, but I'm not absolutely certain, although I certainly love the way this fish, this fish looks. Now, lots of different habitats in southern Mexico, right? Um, and lots of different fish species. But I'll tell you the reason why I keep going back to the place is not that phenomenal diversity there. The reason I keep going back is because Southern Mexico has, has also really weird environments um, that are found in very other, few other places on the planet. And what I'm talking about are so-called sulfide springs. So these are springs fed by groundwater and they have really, really high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide in them. Hydrogen sulfide is this gas that's really highly toxic to all animal life because it essentially shuts down the cells in our body and, and individuals that are exposed to this, to this water, fish that are exposed to this water that don't typically live there, they literally die within minutes. So this is highly, highly poisonous. The cool thing, there's actually some fish in there. Um, before, before I tell you about those fish, uh, I want to totally tell you a little story um, uh, about how I felt like connected really through time with one of the big ichthyologists of the 19th century, and that was Franz Steindachner, um, an Austrian uh, um, uh, ichthyologist that worked at the museum in Vienna. Um, and who described many, many species that are co co uh, common in the hobby including some of the mollies and some of the sore tails, a lot of the cichlids. Um, and one of the species, um, like Cyphophorus hellerii here on top and, and the molly on the bottom, these are species he described. But one of the species he described was uh, a species called Piscilia thermalis, also a molly. Um, and he, he can uh, see an excerpt in German here from the first description, as long as the, the figures um, uh, below from that description, this was published in 1863. Um, and I was always puzzled by this description because um, ever since that first description, never has really has seen this fish again. Um, and we don't, we didn't really know where this fish was collected, other than it was collected in the sulfide springs, exactly the type of springs that uh, springs that I'm interested in. And so all we knew is that uh, an, a guy by the name of Carl Heller collected these fish in a in the state of Chiapas in a sulfide spring called La Esperanza. And so as years went by, um, other ichthyologists revisited this first description and said, you know, like Heller uh, or Steindachner might have been a good ichthyologist, but I don't actually believe that this is a distinct species. This is probably just not, uh, another one of these mollies that looks a little funny because it, looks, uh, it lives in a funny place. Right? So I grew obsessed with this Pacilia thermalis. Um, and so did my st former students, Maura Palacios. And it was actually Maura that first dug up a book uh, authored by a Carl Bartholomeus Heller. And she immediately made the connection that it must have been the Heller that supplied Steindachner with all of his fish. It turns out Carl Heller was actually the son of the imperial gardener uh, in Austria. And his, his father sent him out to go into the world to collect beautiful pl uh, uh, plants for the emperor's garden. And so Heller was one of the first uh, Europeans to really travel through many parts of Mexico. Um, and unlike many other uh, uh, expeditions of the past, Heller primarily traveled alone, so not with lots of others in company. And he spent a lot of time getting to know local people, describing local plants and local faunas. And it turns out he wrote this down in, um, in an autobiography in German uh, about his his uh, travels in Mexico. And I was like, maybe this will be the clue where to find Pacilia thermalis. And it turns out, uh, my slides are slightly out of order here, I apologize. Um, it turns out um, 
that uh, I was right. It turns out that he actually had an entire chapter on sulfide springs. And in that chapter, he described a wide variety of, of landmarks that I was totally familiar with. He described this particular rock here um, that he saw on the way to the springs. He described the old church um, in Tiapa, which actually is a town that we're staying in every year for three to four weeks when we do our field work. And so I, I know exactly where he was. Um, you know, Chiapas is a giant state, but as, as you know, for just for random luck, we actually happened to work in exactly the area where Heller traveled in the 1840s. And so what Heller said, uh, here's a little map of the area, is that uh, La Esperanza, that special sulfide spring, is located between the city of Teapa, right here, and the town of Ixtapanga Hoya, along the highway to Tuxla Gutierrez. And so um, the current highway actually does not go through Ixtapanga Hoya anymore. The current highway actually goes through Pichu Pico Calco, but there is an, indeed an all old road that kind of uh, swerves around these mountains, um, goes up to Ixtapanga Hoya, and this continues further into the mountains. And people say this in a long time ago, this led to Tuxla Gutierrez. So we kept looking and looking and looking for the springs without any luck. Um, and the reason is because we looked on the wrong side of the river. It was not until a few years later that we actually got a scan of the book through Google. Um, and that scan of the book included um, a map that was not present in our original copy. Um, it turns out um, when you an old book dealer, you rip out all the maps out of the old books because you can sell them for more money than just the book itself. But based on the map, we were finally able to see the location of La Esperanza. Teapa is right here. Estabanga Hoya is right here. We've been looking at the wrong side of the river where the current road is. Um, we did not know about the existence of an old road um, that turns out is still actually there. But once we, we, we saw that, we were actually able to go on Google Earth. And we found La Esperanza Spring within about five minutes of searching. So what you can see here is the Ixtapanga Hoya River and this tiny little spring, only about a football field long, um, is actually the La Esperanza Spring where Heller originally collected those fish, right? So one day, uh, about eight years ago or so, nine years ago, we decided to, to try to get up there. And it was this kind of foggy morning. It was uh, a treacherous road up the mountain. It was completely overgrown. Um, the only people we met on the way up were people on horseback that thought we were slightly crazy driving up there. But once we got up there, we found the most beautiful mansion that actually belongs to the former, former governor of, of Tabasco. Um, so it turns out this was not as uh, wild as it seems. It was only the way up that was pretty wild. But um, talking to the landowners, we got permission to um, um, proceed. And eventually we came to this confluence of the sulfur springs and the actual river. And you see the spring essentially flowing in here. It has this milky sulfuric water that flows into the Ixtapanga Hoya River. And of course, we wanted to see well, what kinds of fish are in there. Um, and when it, we dipped our nets in, this is what we caught. Um, we found mollies. Uh, good. Uh, that's what we expected, right? Um, so you see some of the males here and some of the females, and I just uh, put them next to the scans of those origin of that original artwork that was present in the first description. Um, and we felt it was a pretty close match. We actually ended up examining the original specimens that. Um, Heller collected in 1848 at the University in Vienna, and we compared them to the specimens we called, uh, collected in 2011 um, that also um, provided evidence that this is in, indeed the right sp spring, and we found indeed the right fish. The question then becomes, well, is Pacilia thermali something real? Um, but that's not a simple question, because it might just be Pacilia mexicana, remember, that's the one molly that lives everywhere and looks, diff looks different everywhere we look. And it's also a difficult, difficult question because, because it turns out there's more sulfide springs in that region. There's a spring called La Gloria. It has a, um, a molly in there that looks fairly different. There's a spring called Baños de la Zubre. It also has a molly in there that looks different. And they all look different from one another. 
there's springs um, uh, in a place we call La Juvia. It also has a molly in there, and it also looks different. And then there's a spring in a place called Ria Puyacatengo, and guess again, there's also mollies in there, and they look different. And last but not least, there's two more sites, Mogote and El Azuvre. All of these sites are characterized by these toxic conditions, and all of these sites have mollies in there. And the mollies in all of these toxic springs look different from one another. And more, most importantly, they look different than the mollies just outside of the toxic water in, in the neighboring habitats. And when we started to analyze the different traits these fish have, using some morphological analysis, for example, we discovered that um, fish in non-sophitic habitats here on the top, they seem to all look alike. And fish in sulfitic habitats, they all kind of looked similar too. Um, you can notice here the major difference between sulfitic and non-sulfitic fish is actually the sulfur fish have these giant heads. And they have giant heads simply because um, um, there's, uh, they have big gills to live in the toxic environment. But it took like quite a bit of additional work over the past years. We have done uh, analyzed these fish's genomes. We have looked at their physiology. Um, and ultimately what we have learned is that there's indeed multiple species here. Now, the fish um, from, from La Esperanza, these Pacilia thermales, are actually very uh, more closely related to a species called Pacilia sulfuraria. This is the species that occurs in the Banos de la Zubra that I mentioned earlier. Um, but there's also distinct populations of Pacilia mexicana in the sulfite springs. And what we've learned over the past um, 10 years or so of our research is that these fish are uniquely adapted to the toxic conditions. Um, and in the process of adapting to these novel environmental conditions, they actually um, started to stop interbreeding with the fish, the mollies in the normal habitat. So essentially what's happening here is that we have new species evolving as they're adapting to these novel environmental conditions. And it turns out this is not only true for mollies in southern Mexico, it turns out there's other life bearers too in Mexico and the Dominican Republic, in Florida, and also in Costa Rica that have colonized similar sulfide springs. They all evolved similar adaptation. And in the process, they're all in the progress of evolving into distinct species. So I get the real kick out of finding fish in really weird places. Um, and the only place weirder than these sulfide springs that I can think of is the Cueva de la Zubre, also in Mexico. This is a, um, a place that's not only highly toxic, um, but it's also inside a cave. And this place is not only toxic for the fish, but it's also toxic for us because it's an enclosed space. All this sulfide accumulates in the air and it can actually kill the researchers too. So that's why we're um, wearing respirators here. This is also me with my pre-corona weight, um, glancing at these really weird bacterial colonies that are growing from the ceiling and assimilating that sulfide out of the air, gaining energy from it, and in the process, excreting pure sulfuric acid as a, as a, as a, cy as a, as a um, metabolic waste product. We've studied this cave uh, as well for, for many years. Uh, it's chock full of fish. These are also a, a population of mollies. And if you've ever been caving, you probably know that it's really hard to find animals in caves. And this is probably one of the very, very few exceptions on Earth. And the reason for that is because everything is really covered by those sulfide-eating bacteria um, that provide food in a place where otherwise no food can grow because no light, no plants, no plants, no life. Well, here, microbes have essentially replaced the plants. And as a consequence, microbe-eating fish have li literally taken over. Here's a picture of, a, of these cave mollies. Um, this is a female, the larger one, than uh, the male next to each other. And they don't look so starkly different when you look at them like here. But uh, check out this picture where we put a, a cave fish, a cave molly, right next to a molly from a surface habitat. And again, you can see that they differ in many, many traits. Most importantly, perhaps, they've lost their pigmentation and their eyes just uh, shrunk into these tiny, tiny little beads that are barely visible anymore. Um, this is a, another really cool example of the, the weird environments life bearers inhabit and, um, you know, that peculiar adaptations they have to those environments 
And what's even cooler is that these sort of differences, they have evolved in a matter um, of a few thousand years. So we're not talking hundreds of million years of evolution that have happened here. Um, but these are essentially the same species that have simply adapted uh, to different environments and in the process of splitting apart from one another. Other than that, the mollies, of course, also have their enemies. They get eaten by giant water bugs. And this is the, the image of doom that I always show at the end of the talk. Um, but at the end, I just really want to say is that I hope I piqued some curiosity about life bears. They're super diverse um, and it makes them super intriguing. What you see here is different uh, Cyphophorus var uh, variatus platyfish from northern Mexico. All of these males were caught in the same river and just again gives you a glance at just how diverse and how beautiful these fish are in nature. There's not only variation within species, there's very, lots of variation between species. So if you're a life bearer enthusiast, it never gets boring in terms of finding a new challenge. So I'm already kind of over time. I can talk about how we keep fish. Um, I, uh, I would like to make a pitch for the American Life Bearer Association if you're interested in that. Uh, but at this stage, I'd rather stop, uh, let you guys talk. I'm sorry it went a little long, um, but I'm looking forward to chatting with you guys and address any questions you might have.